Three, two, one. All right. So we're basically in. What was that countdown? That was just for you. That was for the Ada. You go three, two, one. (laughs) (laughs) It's like you've never done that before. Okay. I got to keep you on your toes, Sylvie. Rocket launch. I got I got to keep you on your toes. And you're in there editing. You're in there looking. Now you're going to know. Three, two, one. That's the cold open. It's like the clap of the virtual recording session. Hello, and welcome to Talking Too Live with Chris Savage. I'm your host, Chris Savage. I'm joined by the one, the only, Sylvie Lubau. Sylvie, we have a great guest today. We have such a good guest today. Mark McLeod is here. So good. He's an executive coach. He was the CFO of Shopify, CFO at FreshBooks early on, ran an investment bank, and he is also, he is a Buddhist. He is a very thoughtful, very deep thinker, shared a lot of lessons. This is a raw, real episode we have for folks today. Raw and real. Two R's. Two R's. Yeah. Two R's. R-R-R. <laughs> Are you in pirate mode right now? Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, what's got you talking too loud, Sylvie? Oh, man. I was I was trying to think. Honestly, I just finished Sex Education, final season. I don't know if you've ever watched that show. Okay, I know of it, but I have not watched it. That is a show with so much heart and tenderness. And I was bawling. Just like big fat tears streaming down my face, but like good tears, you know? Okay. You're recommending this. You're not, you're, this isn't a side. I am recommending everyone cry. Okay. Cry good cries. Cry. Get a good cry. Check out this show. I mean, if you like, you weren't, didn't you tell me you like never have I ever. Mm -hmm. So if you like that, you're definitely going to like this. Um, Okay. All right. Okay. That's what I'm talking to a lot about, you know? Well, and then more broadly, when television shows end, you know, it's it, it's kind of it's it's it, there's some heartache there. There's a part of your being that disappears. Yes, I understand. It's like it becomes a part. It's like your you friend, get your so parasocial connected. relationship. Yeah, you get so invested. Like, real people. They and, are. And really, what we're here to talk today about is the power of celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> no, but. It's different than a movie. You know what I mean? Different than movies. No, it's just more time, right? It's more so time. Much more time. It's more yeah, time. More time. It's more time. More time. Yeah, that's, what it's, that's what it is. <laughs> What's got <laughs> you talking too loud? You know, I feel like I have a funny one, which is my kids are back in school, which is great. And um, everyone's on a schedule. But now there's like a lot of school stuff. Last night was like an all parents association meeting. And my kids go to a Quaker school that I went to growing up. That's nice. Yeah. So it was a Quaker meeting last night for parents. And a Quaker meeting, for those who don't know, is basically everyone gets into this room and you sit in these benches that face each other and you sit there in silence. And then if you feel this urge to speak, like if something comes over you and you have to speak, (laughs) you can get up and speak and everyone will listen. You know that everyone's listening and what have you. And so it was very funny experience for me because... I have not done this in so long, um, you know, in over 20 years. And I'm sitting there and I have, I've not been in the, it was in the same room that we used to do Quaker meetings. <laughs> and so, so I like, oh, that's where I sit. And I like went over to the same bench. It was like my brain remembered, like, this is where I sit. It's like muscle and memory. Down. Yeah. And then it was complete silence, you know, and everyone's, it's kind of awkward at first. And I'm looking around the room and I'm like, okay, so what did I do? What do I do here? What do I do here? And I start counting the window panes and there's like so many, I'm like, do the math. I'm like, oh, I'm faster than I used to be. (laughs) And it it was like just a very funny experience also because, you know, I went to the school and I, some of the other parents also went to the school at the same time as me. And I'm looking over there and I'm just like giggling, which you're not supposed to do. What a time warp. Like I ended and I didn't really want it to end. And so uh, nice. It was cool. It was cool. And it was cool to think like my kids are in there and they're bored and they're trying not to laugh and they're trying to figure it out. And like, it was like a nice kind of way to relate to what they're doing and what I used to do. And I don't know. It was was cool. I love that. Yeah. Connective tissue. Yeah. I didn't think I'd be talking too loud about that right before. Uh, yeah. my wife, Zan was like, we got to do this. I got to see what this thing is all about. Like my kids are doing it. We, our kids are doing it. We got to go. Yeah. And I was like, whatever. I was just making all these <laughs> stupid jokes. About it. And then after I was like, that was, that was great. That was so great. 
<laughs> Did Zan like it? Yeah, she was like, I was feeling really awkward at the beginning. This is so bizarre. <laughs> She's so silent. She's like, and I didn't want it to end. I didn't want it to end. That's so special. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt about this interview with Mark. I didn't want it to end. You know, we could have really kept going. He has a lot of wisdom. And I would say it's not, even though he says this, it's not just because of his age. This is a guy (laughs) that's been journaling his whole life. He's incredibly thoughtful. Um, He's very charismatic. And he, he, there's just, there was a lot of knowledge in this one. So I, I love that. I'm excited for you all to listen right now to the interview with Mark McLeod. Mark, so good to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Chris, it's a true pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's fun to connect. Like you and I, we've known each other a little bit online, but it wasn't until this summer at Turing Fest that we got to really spend time together. And it was awesome to spend time with you and have dinner with you. And just like your vibe, like you emanate somebody who is like so comfortable with who they are. Like it, you just, you, and it's, I'm afraid of what I'm going to say, honestly. Like, I, I feel like you're going to make me too comfortable on the show. And I'm going to, I just told you, we'll cut something out if, if, it, if it, you know, you don't want it. I'm like, oh God, what am I going to say? Because so you just funny. have that vibe. So um, I'm really excited to have you on the show. That's a very kind of you to say. Uh, that's one of the superpowers of getting older. I uh, just celebrated <laughs> my 53rd birthday uh, this month. And you just become more and more comfortable with who you are. And it's like, here's who I am. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, peace. It's all good. That's awesome. Um, Well, as you know, the show is called Talking Too Loud. Because when I get excited, I cannot control the vibe of my voice. That already just happened. I think I might have just peaked. (laughs) But um, we'd love to start the show by asking our guests, what has them talking too loud? So what has you talking too loud today? Yeah. So, I mean, outside of uh, business, which we will talk about, it's, it's always music. I have a really deep passion for music. I actually run a record label called Deep Down Music that is the number 50 Amazing. progressive house label in the world. And I'm on a countdown wow. to uh, Amsterdam dance event that I go to every year, which is equal parts industry networking and then partying your face off. I'm usually like a <laughs> just tiny fraction of myself when I leave. So we're, we're 20 <laughs> days until I get there. And uh, so I'm in kind of training for that now. Okay, I need to go deeper on the record label. Like, you know, okay. I wasn't even thinking about this. I think I knew this because you did a set right at the at the conference. But so go go deeper. What do you what the what are you even talking about? You have a record label? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've been a kind of a rave and after hours DJ since the late '90s, back when it was difficult and expensive because it was vinyl. <laughs> Yeah, and um, it's just been a huge passion uh, of mine uh, ever since. And so I was like a pretty active DJ with lots of residencies right up until I became a dad, and that wasn't super compatible with having young kids. So I put it on hold for a bit, but I always would do a set online. My kids are older now. My eldest uh, celebrates her 19th birthday on Saturday. And um, during COVID, during lockdown, I just started making tracks and I produced 20 tracks. Some of them were garbage, but some weren't. And I just like everything I do in life, I kind of have to do all the way. And I was just like, you know what, there's probably no one running an underground electronic music record label who has my business background and frankly, my resources. So like, screw it, I'm going to give it a go. It's a huge labor of love. The returns, not monetary, just the returns in general in no way justify the effort, even making music. (laughs) Like I just did a, a remix for another label and it's like days and days of effort. And like, let me get that kick drum just right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this music is disposable in some way. Like DJs buy music on a site called Beatport and there's 25,000 new songs uploaded to Beatport every week. Wow. Not in my genre, wow. but across yeah. all genres. Yeah. But like, you're always looking for the freshest track. So they have a short shelf life. But the label, we've got artists all around the world. I'll be meeting uh, most of the roster when I'm in Amsterdam. So we're going to kind of you know, hatch some master plans as we think about the release schedule for next year. And like I say, we're going to absolutely party our faces off. Uh, so it should be, should <laughs> be really good. so wild. What was the song that got you into the, the electronic rave scene? Yeah, it's a, actually a 1980s house track called Work It to the Bone. And um, we're gonna have to play that track, Savage. I know. We're gonna I, have to play a, that we track. We gotta get that going. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm obsessed with My dad was um, lead singer in a rock band in Scotland. I lived in Scotland until I was 11. He could play all the instruments. And um, 
I don't think he's super into electronic music, but he was a huge inspiration for me. And I was always listening to music. And I was a drummer in a rock band in high school, which was thankfully before digital cameras and social media, because I had long permed <laughs> hair. And I had like lumber jackets with the sleeves cut off. So you could see how big my oh, arms my were. God. They're not big, but... You know, That's that yeah, but you felt they were big at the time. Yeah. I felt they were big. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's all that you know, matters. I mean, like, I wish we had that content right now. We would <laughs> no, just, I don't. We would I cut don't. to it. We would. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a funny it's a funny moment. I think because of that, right? Like everything's documented now. Our kids, That's right? Every you know, moment. my kids will look at my phone and be like, they'll want to watch the videos. Basically, they just show them growing up, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it's like weird how normal that is. And then also what you're saying is like that freedom to explore that freedom to play. Do you think that that's like affecting leaders and entrepreneurs in other ways? Do you think there's something about the fact that everything is documented or the fact that everything is on social media now has, has changed things in a big way? Like, do you see that across the, the CEOs you coach, the businesses you've been in? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we always joke, right? Didn't happen unless you post about it. But um, I think it's just where it manifests is um, a real inability to pay attention to one thing for, you know, more than five seconds and just constantly looking for dopamine hits and like, oh, my God, there's a Slack message. I need to respond to it. You know, like we're just not living with intention. And so for many of my CEOs, the business is happening to them. They are not happening to the business. And when they come, often they're overwhelmed, but there's a lot of things that they could do to take back control. Um, And also just, I deeply believe, you know, I'm I'm in the venture back startup world. I've been in that world since 1999. I get the expectations that come with raising capital. Uh, I've been a VC, uh, like I get it. But I I actually deeply believe that um, happy, healthy humans are gonna build better companies for the long run. And also, if you think about the act of building a startup, going from zero to wherever, it's inherently creative. You are creating something out of nothing. And like, how can you create when you're stressed, right? Those inspiring moments actually come in the gaps, right? It's in the shower when we're on a hike. And it's because our rational mind is like a small fraction of our actual capability. And when we allow our intuition to kind of bubble up, that's when the magic happens. And so a huge part of what I'm trying to do with my clients is create space for magic in not just in their business, but in every aspect of their life. I love that. And it's a very, you know, elevated way of thinking, right? That takes like hard won lessons. Can you, for people who don't know your story, can you give us like the very quick journey that got you to this place? Yeah, for sure. So I'm a CPA by training. Um, and I've been in the venture back startup world since 1999. I uh, spent 14 years as CFO for a bunch of companies. I was the first CFO at Shopify, raised the series A and series B, which was an insider round. Uh, CFO at FreshBooks and a bunch of other companies. In between those two, <clears throat> I was one of the original general partners in Real Ventures, which for a decade was Canada's largest and most active seed stage fund. I uh, founded and ran an investment bank called Surepath Capital Partners that uh, focused only on uh, software as a service companies that serve the SMB, so small and mid-sized business market. Had a stupid amount of success with that. And we can get into that, but along the way, investment banking is not for the faint of heart. It's not like, hey, if I want a nice lifestyle business, I think I'll start yeah. an investment bank. And surprise, surprise, along the way, um, my first marriage ended. And um, I kind of took a year to reflect and unpack that and reread a, a bunch of years of journals. And I saw this pattern across all of my roles where the days I was most excited about were the days where I had a one-on-one coaching or advisory conversation with a CEO. So I was like, hey, why don't I just like stop being an investment banker and just coach CEOs? And so then the world conveniently served up a pandemic in March of 2020. And so for a brief second, companies stopped buying companies and I used that window to shut the bank down and went back and got certified as a coach. So I'm now in year four of coaching. I coach VCs, but my main thing is coaching the CEOs of either venture or private equity backed technology companies that are at scale. There's a lot in that. 
There's a lot of what you just said. Well, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> well, well, that's not my, I think the point, is, the, no, it's also just extremely transparent, which I really appreciate. And I would love to go a little bit deeper on a couple things there. Sure. One, you, so you said your marriage ended. Yep. The, would you have want your marriage, marriage not to have ended? Like, you know, is there advice you would have given yourself that you think could have changed the course of that? Or was that one of those things that it actually, you were like, okay, this is a part of my life that's moved. Like what, how do you, when I hear that, I think, what advice does he have for me? What advice does he have for other entrepreneurs, especially if they're stressed? That's the question I'm trying to ask. Yep. Well, first of all, I fundamentally believe everything happens for us, not to us. It may not feel that way in the moment. And when that marriage ended, it didn't feel that way. But I wouldn't be a coach today if that hadn't happened. And um, it, you know, forced a lot of really positive change. Um, I think I'm a much happier, healthier human uh, today. I think I have a, I know I have a deeper relationship with my kids. I got married again in January. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I have designed my life so that every day is great, literally. Now, yeah, some experiments yeah. along that journey were ill-advised. So during COVID, I, you know, I really like champagne. I was just like, why is champagne just for special occasions? If every day is great, <laughs> every day is worth celebrating. I'm going to drink champagne every literally champagne every day. day. <laughs> and I did it for two years. Oh, but uh, I'm actually a really passionate uh, yogi and also super into CrossFit. And CrossFit is like the opposite of Fight Club. You must talk about it. So we've, <laughs> but, um, you know, drinking champagne every day is counter to my spiritual goals and my practice and certainly counter to my fitness goals. So now I only drink it two or three days a week. So, you know, <laughs> but so here's the, to your question, you know, what's the advice for you right now? Again, I, I, I'm in the startup world, startup world for better or worse, is quite male, especially at the top. So most, not all, but most of my clients are, are male. Uh, many are married. And when I talk with them and ask them, you know, what is most important to them, they all say what I said in my first marriage, right? My wife and my kids are like the most important thing in my life. But if we look at where they spend their time and most importantly, their presence, that's bullshit is not the most important thing, right? You know, work gets more than everything. You muster up some amount of energy for your kids and then your spouse gets the leftovers. And so that's not your intention when you go into marriage. Uh, it's not your intention during marriage. And so the takeaway is to actually really truly live with intention. I, uh, I'm a Buddhist and, um, when we got married in January, uh, I thought a lot about my values from that practice. I call it a practice, not a religion. I think it's just a framework for how to live. And, you know, one of the key concepts is that nothing is permanent. Everything, you know, everything material is impermanent. Our bodies, jobs, everything. The pain you feel will go away. Everything is impermanent but I want to be with my new wife forever. How I reconcile those things is to show up every single day with the intention to be the best partner I can. Every day is a new. So it's, it was, this marriage restarts every single day. Um, and so I am absolutely living with intention. Now that is easy because I am running a one person business. You know, my biggest client, you know, the CEO has 1200 people. He's got a target on his back. Everyone wants a piece of him. His reality is very different. But I still believe, you know, like what's the point of grinding for seven or 10 years? Because that's how long it takes, at least, to have some outcome only to, you know, at the cost of your health and your love. I actually think the point of life is to be happy. Now, that sounds indulgent. But it's not, this is ironic for a guy who runs a record label and goes to nightclubs and, you know, <laughs> where people off, listen yeah. to his music, yeah. <laughs> consuming yeah. little white pills. But <laughs> happiness is not ecstasy. Happiness is being in this moment and needing nothing. Pure contentment. 
pure presence. And I believe that is possible for everyone. Um, and when you show up, we are fully present. It's a gift. It's a gift to yourself. It's a gift to those you're with. If you're with people as a leader, you just, you know, imagine. So here's one reality. CEO's got back to back to back. He's got eight or 10 meetings a day. He's super frazzled. One ends late. He shows up. He hasn't thought about it. He comes in and you get some fraction of his presence versus he says, well, he recognizes, well, that's not possible. I'm going to have fewer meetings. I'm going to have a gap between them. I'm going to ground myself. I'm going to remind myself what is the objective of this meeting. I'm going to fully show up. And the second that objective is accomplished, I'm going to leave, you know, and like, like, it's like athletes, you know, they, again, I only work with the CEOs of companies that have raised lots of capital. They have huge expectations on their shoulders. And I remind them all the time, you're like a professional athlete. LeBron James has like a whole team around him to make sure that he's excellent, right? He's got sports psychologist, he's got nutritionist, you, you physio, you name it. He's got a team to make him successful. And then what is the key for mm -hmm. athletes is rest. You come in, you crush it, you rest and then recover and you go again. So this always on bro culture in the startup world is just a bunch of bullshit. And, um, it, it actually doesn't lead to peak performance. So I'm not, I'm under no illusions. It's not like, you know, I'll work for four hours and I'll go golf or whatever, but you're going to be far more creative. You're going to create far more enterprise value. I think by operating with intention and, uh, slowing down and doing a few things super well. Yeah, that resonates. And I, I think when we were in person, I think I told you this, but it was like, for me, it was the moment of, cause I, I would say I've, I've worked very hard to have balance and to actually like proactively spend time with my family and mm -hmm. the presence thing I think is like so true, but there was a moment that it switched for me, which was when we decided to buy back the company. And I remember sitting down with my wife because before that I always told her, well, someday I'm going to sell this thing. And then, mm -hmm you know, then I'm going to be balanced. Like once that happens. And then it was that moment. I was like, well, if we're not going to sell it <laughs> and I'm signing up to continue to do this and at that point, it had already been over 10 years, 11 years. I think I was like, I got to take real vacation. I got to be around. I got to be around. Like I got to pretend like we sold it. Like how do I get myself into the mindset of actually recovering. And I didn't understand that that's what I was saying. Like I, yeah. I thought it was about vacation and time. And then of course the result was, Oh wait, of course it's better to take time off. Of course it's better to be balanced. Like it's easier to make better decisions. And what you said about creativity, at least in my experience has been 100% true that it happens in the gaps and it happens in the other time. And I think there's another lesson in there, which is like for your team, mm -hmm. you're often actually stunting growth. Mm hmm right? Cause like if you're trying to do everything and you're trying to make every call, then your team can't step up in the same way. That's right. The CEO is like buried and the team underneath them is like, give me scope, give me exactly. responsibility, give me yeah. exposure. It's tragic. I want to go one other thing in that first statement you said that's sticking with me is you went back to your journals from every yes. day and you like, how did you get started doing that? How did you build that as a practice? Cause that seems like an incredible thing to have. Now, I imagine a lot of people want to do it, but how did you actually do it so that you had the evidence to go back to? I just did it. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, like I think in undergrad, I just started keeping a journal. Um, I just intuitively felt that, um, it would be great to just capture what happened. Some of it's just chronological, Hey, this happened, but a lot of it becomes then how I feel like observations. I was journaling last night and have realized some things that I'm not happy about, about kind of how I'm prioritizing my time this week. Um, so it was just an intuitive thing. And so I've, I've done it for almost my entire adult life. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, the, all those journals were available to me, you know, in that year, uh, my marriage ended beginning of January, like January, 2019. And I took the balance of that year to just kind of, um, learn whatever lessons I needed to learn, uh, heal the scar tissue. I think I didn't want to get into a relationship because of a deficiency or a need. 
I wanted to get into a relationship because I was ready. And so, I, you know, it took the year. But uh, yeah, journaling is super powerful. And uh, I, I recommend it for all of my clients. And some are quite intimidated at the notion of, hey, I'm just going to have this blank page and just free form. And so I always recommend them this thing called the five minute journal, which as you might have guessed from the title, takes five minutes to complete. <laughs> and it's just a series of prompts. And it's quite focused around uh, gratitude. And um, as a practicing Buddhist, I have an explicit daily gratitude practice. And that's super powerful. And uh, without getting super woo woo, but like whatever energy you put out into the universe, you get more of. And if you're just like super unhappy, you're just going to keep finding things to be unhappy about. And this is a thing that a lot of founder CEOs struggle with, especially because they have this huge vision and they're nowhere near completing their vision. And so like, how can I be happy? But like they made so much progress. And so if you focus on that, the progress, that's usually powerful. It usually feels pretty good. And even on the worst days, there's something to be grateful for, even if it's just that you made it through the day. Like that was a shit show. I'm here. I'm still in one piece. Tomorrow's going to be better. I'm really excited about that. You know, so I think it's super powerful. What this is an example of is uh, self-awareness. And if you think about the trajectory of a CEO of a high growth company, they have to, as Toby from Shopify says all the time, requalify for their job every year, right? It's not the same company. You've been the CEO of Wistia for a long time. Your job has changed probably every single year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the atomic unit of progress, the thing that enables you to requalify for your job every year is self-awareness, having an explicit learning loop. This is what I could have done better. I, I don't like how I did this. And so I use my journal for that. And then I do a monthly review with guided questions. I do a quarterly, I do an annual, um, yeah, so I'm, I work on self-awareness and, and I think that's key, a key muscle for, well, for everyone, but especially for leaders of high growth companies. I love that. You've been in some incredible companies that everybody knows. You've coached a ton of incredible CEOs. You've bought companies, you've funded them. What makes the companies that really deliver on the promise? Like they really scale, they 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 really grow like what is the difference in those companies like why do they deliver is it the market is it the ceo is it the team is the investors like how do you think about it it's yes 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 <laughs> well maybe not the maybe not the investors but um well with some, with some exceptions I'll, I'll unpack that so as a former seed stage vc uh and now masochist i.e angel <laughs> It, for me, it's all about the person. If I get the person right, they're going to figure everything else out. So backing the right founder is, is hugely important. <clears throat> and a founder that has the right motivation. If you're kind of in love with the market, hey, there's a bunch of money to be made here. I don't think that's an enduring source of motivation. And like you just get a pay raise and like you feel good for a few days and then you're back to normal, right? So money's not the thing. If you're in love with the product you've built, then you have a closed mindset. So you're just like evangelizing. No, you don't understand. This is the, you need this widget. This is the best possible widget. So that doesn't work. It's only if you're in love with the problem. If you're just like endlessly fascinated with the problem, it's why you get up in the morning. So I definitely look for founders that are just, just like totally in love with, totally obsessed with the problem they're trying to solve. That's a thing. Uh, obviously, product is, is su super important. If you look at the companies that achieve outlier outcomes, they've built a fundamentally better mousetrap. If I take all the elements of value creation over the life cycle of a company, by far the biggest single slice of the pie is distribution or go-to-market. And so, yeah, product is super important, but you have to create this repeatable sausage machine that you just like know exactly where to go to get a customer, how long they stick around, therefore how much they're worth, how much I can pay for them. And you have lots of channels with room to grow to keep getting more customers, right? Like the ultimate pitch for a growth stage investor is like, I've just figured out the recipe. I can make 10 sausages today. Give me your money. I can make a hundred sausages and they'll all taste the same. And you're just like, yeah, perfect. 
Let me back up the Brinks truck and let's do this, right? Now, you can get all of these elements right. You can have an amazing CEO, an amazing product, but if you don't actually get the timing right, then the outcome won't be optimal, right? And so there's luck and timing is a, a huge element. Uh, so hard to figure that out up front, to be honest, though. I guess that's why they call it venture. I feel like the, the beat just dropped in the club. Like it yeah. just happened. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And I mean, especially the problem piece, right? How do you know if you're on the right problem? Like, can you, is it easy to sense like, and uh, we're really talking about the beginning of someone's journey, right? So if you're talking to somebody and you're trying to decide, like, does this person care about the problem? Like, how do you suss out the people who actually do? Yeah, it's tough. You know, so if I take Toby at Shopify, uh, just that's by far the biggest outcome I've been associated with. Uh, although I was there in the very early days. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, when I first showed up, uh, I think there were 12 people in a room above, it wasn't a Starbucks, but it was like a Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he, that this problem was his purpose at that point. You know, he wanted to sell snowboards online. He was pissed off that you couldn't like, there wasn't a good place to get snowboards and he built a piece of software because Yahoo stores sucked. So I think he was just scratching his own itch at the time. But I think the beauty is just how pure he is. He's just so deeply technical. And so there was a lot like you knew this is a guy who whatever he builds, it's going to be great. You know, on the timing front, I remember when they were trying to raise the Series A uh, before I got involved. A lot of VCs passed because they thought the market was too small. So that was wrong. But um, yeah, it's hard to solve. Like, it's really hard up front to solve for that. This, you know, this is my purpose. It's absolutely his purpose now. He's a billionaire. He doesn't need to work. He works as hard as he's ever worked because it is his purpose to make commerce simpler for everyone, to enable anyone to start a store and grow it. That's like a problem you'll sort of never be done with, right? And they're pretty far down the path with online, but online is actually a small fraction of total commerce. So he's got a lot of unfinished business. So I, the thing I look for actually is intellectual horsepower, right? Because any problem that is worth dedicating your life to is going to be like this onion with endless layers. And is someone going to have the horsepower and the stamina to really kind of keep peeling off the layers, you know? So it's tough to say. I'd like to say I've got it all figured out, uh, but I've got plenty failed investments <laughs> to go along with the ones that worked. And let's go to coaching. So um, I've had different coaches at different points in time. Um, some I've met randomly. Some I've met through trusted folks. I've been in leadership groups like Vistage. Like, but I was kind of thinking it would be interesting to know when people come to you, and what are they, what state are they in? Like, should, are they coming to you late? Are they coming to you early? Like, what does it look like when you, when you start working with somebody? And I ask this question because I know a lot of our listeners and our viewers, you know, they're running their business. They're trying to figure out, should I get help or not? You know, what are the signs or signals that you would really benefit from a coach? Like, what does that look like? Well, first of all, I think if, if you're a pre product market fit, you don't even have a company. You're not a CEO, you're a product manager. So spending time getting coaching on all this other stuff is a distraction. Sure, get mentors and stuff who could help you build a better product. I'm not that guy. But you should just be 100% focused on building a product and finding some segment of the market that wants your product. Then you can bother with all the company building. So for me, um, by definition, it's post-product market fit and you're into scaling. You found your first channel. You are starting to elevate from working in the business, building product, shipping product, taking out the trash, to working on the business. Do I have the right people? Are they pointed in the right direction? Do they have the resources they needed to succeed? Making that elevation of altitude is actually how you begin to scale as a CEO. And that's uh, and then going back to, again, I only coach CEOs of venture or private equity funded companies. That's a one-way journey to deliver a big outcome. 
The biggest outcomes tend to be founder led start to finish. So the purpose of my coaching is to make sure that those CEOs are always growing faster than their business. So I really look for f- folks that are in the scaling, have some semblance of a leadership team. Uh, so now we can really elevate them. And so they're working exclusively on. Are there people that you think are uncoachable? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, people who think their shit doesn't stink, <laughs> which goes back to self-awareness, right? If you believe your own hype, um, then you think you're great. And it's not that I think people should think that they're horrible, <laughs> but you're, you're not open to learning. You're not open to feedback. It's the number one thing I look for as, as an investor. Or it's number one thing I look for as a coach. What is the, the hardest challenge that you can share that you've had to help someone get through as a, as a founder? Like, can you give us like a, a war story or something that's like, damn, that's, that's freaking hard. And then, wow, they got through it. Like, yeah, uh, there's so many, <laughs> <laughs> we could do a 10 episode uh, series <laughs> on that, but, um, yeah, I'll pick one. I have a client, uh, in the restaurant industry They provide software for, for restaurants, uh, whose revenue went to zero during COVID, like literally zero. And uh, I mostly coach founder CEOs, but this was a CEO who was brought in by investors. You know, so we had to navigate. It's a new company. Sub- subsequently discovered, like, hey, we actually we actually need to rebuild the product, kind of from scratch. So he just faced crazy challenges. And um, going back to, even though he wasn't the founder, he operates with so much passion, so much conviction. He could picture the vision for this company really deeply. And to his credit, managed to convince existing and new investors to believe in that vision, kept the lights on, rebuilt the product, and now he's completely crushing it. But, you know, he was facing some pretty dark days. I can't actually add a ton of value to a company with zero revenue. I'm kind of all about helping scale. But as a guy who's been a VC and done billions in deals, a lot of my CEOs often will kind of use me as a sounding board for kind of deal related stuff as well. And so we had lots of discussions about how to keep the lights on, how to keep morale, what we can tell the staff, what we can't, magnitude of layoffs, right? I think many CEOs don't cut decisively and largely enough. And so you make a cut and then you're, uh, rebuilding trust and you have to go and cut again, you just cut the trust even more. Right. So, um, talking through all of those things and just, yeah, trying to keep them sane. Um, but yeah, he's, he's in a really good spot now. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's hard stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I don't do this in all of my cases, but I just believed in him so much that when there was a bridge, I invested in it when revenue was zero. Wow. Um, so I, I really believe in him. Yeah. I mean, it seems like these relationships can get pretty personal. The separation from between like work and life is like probably not showing up in these coaching conversations. I would imagine every form of coaching is life coaching. If things are falling apart in your personal life, that impacts how you show up at work. If your business is falling apart, you bring that home with you. It's all a package. The very first session, uh, when I'm onboarding, I have clients rate aspects of their personal life and their business from very unsatisfied to very satisfied. And we unpack them. So I'll go over. It's not therapy. My sessions are on Zoom. If they were in person, I wouldn't have people lying on a couch. But it's not unrelated to therapy. And we'll go anywhere. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the beauties of being older. I I've been curious about coaching for a long time. I actually bought my first book on coaching in 2002 and uh, concluded that I lack the gray hair and moral authority to crush it as a coach. And <laughs> anyway, I got the white beard now. <laughs> you can judge the moral authority for yourself. But I do think there's an advantage to having some scar tissue and being older. And um, as someone with a, a deep spiritual practice, I'm comfortable going anywhere and everywhere and being completely open. And, and so that disarms people. 
Um, so yeah, I'm super close. I love, like literally love my clients. And uh, yeah, it's a very deep relationship. You're going to make Sylvie cry. You are. I'm feeling <laughs> disarmed. Yeah, I can see. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> Business can be so beautiful. <laughs> it can. Oh, my God. Um, right, no, that's cool. Me cry, Sylvie. Yeah. Right. Well, we I mean, I think it's also like a lot of the stuff you're talking about is stuff that it just really resonates deeply with me as like hard, really hard one lessons, which is like you can't separate work and life. It is nope. one thing. Like if your yep. kid's having a horrible day and something's or they're sick or whatever, like that will, unless you're a robot, that's going to show up in some way with how you show up at work. And that's 100%. normal. And like, we actually need to like talk about it more, you know, <laughs> like as we check in with each other at work and like in life, I think it's pretty normal, uh, that if you can actually express those things to your friends, to your family, to your spouse, that's what helps you process it. Right. It's like, admitting sure. that it is all connected you know it's not severance that's right and by the way when you don't express it and you try and bury it it just shows up later with physical symptoms your body yeah. starts to break yeah have you ever read the book by josh watkins watkins that's like the art of learning nope he's a like a chess master guy mm. And one of the really interesting things in the book, and we know about like chess grandmasters today is, you know, they burn unbelievable amounts of calories while they're sitting there in the chess match. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. actually. Yeah. And a lot of them will lose like seven pounds, like before and after like a three hour uh, match. And it's because their brain's working so hard. They're so intense. They're under so much stress that your, your heart rate elevates and all these things. One of the ways to train for it is to physically work out. Mm hmm. And so now all the like grandmasters are also like lifting and running and doing all these things because stress is all connected. Right. And so if it's like, if you can handle more stress in workouts, you can handle more stress in the chess match. And I think it's exactly the same at work, which is like, yep. it is all interconnected. It's going to show up later. So managing it also is about actually saying like, Hey, if this is one thing, what else can I do? where I can in a controlled way, put myself under stress or manage yep. that so that I can handle it at work. I love that. And so I started CrossFit when I was running my investment bank. And, uh, so there's a few takeaways there, uh, for your audience. One is like, I was crazy busy, but I still made time five days a week to go. And I was on planes, trains, and automobiles, but the beauty of CrossFit is in any city you can find a CrossFit gym and you're gonna mm -hmm. understand the workout. So that was a thing. And on days where I missed it, which was rare, my thinking was less clear. I had less energy. I needed to use coffee more. I use that word deliberately. But when I did it, I had more energy, more positivity. And also you do some like batshit crazy stuff in CrossFit and when like, you just do, do something that you either legitimately couldn't do or only thought you couldn't do. And then you show up to work and now you're going to deal with some buyer on the other. Like, I am going to kick your ass today. You should see what I just did. So it yeah, was I hear that, hugely man. positive. That's, that's how I feel about workouts too. It's like, if I, I just worked my ass off at something mm -hmm. and then I go in and like, I can handle this. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, it's not for everybody, but like, for me, at least, like, it's just so, I feel, I feel that so much. It's like the confidence kicks in. It's just easier to deal with hard problems totally. or things that are, you know, you're, you start your day by doing something hard. It is a lot easier to go through the rest of the day. Like, I already did a really yeah, yeah. hard thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, we mostly, so CEOs are guilty of this. Everyone who's like a knowledge worker, right? You know, working on a computer, like we identify with here. We think we are our brains. And like, this is a very small amount of like, there's this whole body, it needs to be moved, right? Like this, there's a whole being it. We're not just the thoughts that are going incessantly in our head. It's so important to move. Love you have it. to sweat every day. Um, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was like very deep. I loved this conversation. I think our audience is really going to benefit from it. Um, where can people follow you, connect with you to learn more? Uh, yeah, I have a website, markmcleod.me. Um, I blog there pretty regularly. I post on LinkedIn every day. Uh, 
So yeah, from my website, there's links to the various socials. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Mark is just in there. Mark has got a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience. Um, and I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's been a few episodes like this recently where I feel like I'm just like nodding the whole time because the person who we're talking to is sharing lessons and insights that for me personally are so hard won. Like I want to try to emphasize when he's talking about the balance and he's talking about your presence and he's talking about all these things, like how you have like a fast growing business and what's important and all, all this stuff. I'm like, man, this guy is, he is, he is dropping truths right now. So, you know, I was nodding like a maniac, um, through this one, but also a very chill maniac who's, <laughs> who's ready to hit some house music and party. A very chill maniac. I know. I love that he's like, he occupies these two very different spaces. He even talked about it, like the, the spiritual sort of like Buddhist space. And then also like this electronic rave club rat space. But yes, he found balance. He found the balance. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciated, I think, you know, a few times we've had folks come on the show and talk about like, why having time to just create time to just rest is important, uh, especially for CEOs and founders. But in this interview, it was I like really got it. Um, maybe it was the athlete analogy. Um, maybe it was also just I don't know. It it really struck me in this in this episode that like of course you need breaks between meetings to like fully show up. Of course you need breaks. Period to like fall back in love with the same problem every day. Like, I don't know. That was. And that you can't separate, like you can't actually separate work and life. You can't, you can't. And I, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like a thing that we have to keep hearing because I think, you know, it's one of those things that's easy to hear, hard to do. Totally. You, know, you can, you can get that advice, but then it's like, well, I am really stressed at work. How do I do, you know, what do you use to make yourself more present when you're with your friends? or when you're with your family. And I think that that is actually working on those transition moments, which often are like, man, how was your day? It sucked. But like this one part was good. You know, it's just that, that practice of like recognizing it is obviously such an important, helpful aspect here. And it's so easy to not. I think that's back to the kind of where the interview started talking about how hyper-connected everything is. Totally. And you know, when you're feeling hyper-connected, you can't separate. I think it's why even when I was talking about the Quaker meeting at the beginning, it was such a rare thing to sit there for 35 minutes in silence. Totally. And, uh, you know, I'm someone who's meditated a lot and like, I don't sit there that long and I definitely don't sit there that long with that, with that many people. And so there's like this weird, oh, like, yeah, oh, there was something really lovely about this. And it's like so hard because we're so good at finding things that attract our attention and keep us entertained and keep us stressed and keep us worried to actually free yourself of that is a challenge. And then, but then when you can do it, the benefits like really accrue. A hundred percent. 100, 100 percent, 100 percent. Oh God. It's time. That means, yeah, that means it's time. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review the show wherever you listen to it. A lot more stuff coming out of Wistia Studios. If you haven't seen it yet, check out Fix My Setup. Really excited about that. That series has been doing great. We are actually looking for more folks to be on the next season. So if you want your setup fixed, please reach out and we'll see you soon.